Hi, my name is Jordan Wilson. I'm on the board of directors for the CFA Society Saskatchewan, and I'm here today with Paula Meyer, who is also on the board. We're going to talk a bit about her career trajectory, the choices that she has made, being a woman in finance, being a mother, juggling the work-life balance. So it should be an interesting conversation and follow up nicely with a lot of the things that we discussed in our high school and university speaker series. So Paula Meyer is an associate in the Fundamental Research Group Public Equities with TD Asset Management. She holds a Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Regina. Paula majored in finance and she holds the CFA designation. At TD Asset Management, Paula provides equity research and investment recommendations for the public equity portfolios and currently is focused on covering the global real estate sector. Paula has prior experience in the utilities, IT, and consumer sectors. So quite a wide variety of equities that she's covered in her time at TD. She's involved in a number of charitable organizations, as well as her work on the CFA Society Saskatchewan board. So an interesting background that Paula has. And out of all our board members, she probably is the closest to that pure, quote unquote, financial analyst that makes up the CFA designation. So we're going to start our conversation with Welcome, and what led you to get into finance in the first place? And we've talked in other areas about how women may go into accounting, may go into law, but on a percentage basis, they tend to be underrepresented in, in finance. So why did you choose finance as a major in university? And why did you choose to pursue it afterwards as a career path? Hi, Jordan. Thanks for having me on to talk about my my path towards finance and my experience in the finance industry. Uh, I think, why did I decide to enter finance? That's a very interesting question. Um, I was in business in university and kind of taking the intro classes to the different disciplines, marketing, HR, finance, accounting, etc. And uh, I don't think that there's one particular thing that pointed me towards finance. Um, it was it was a bit of trial and error. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I I might have found accounting a, a tad boring, and I I think I liked the dynamic of finance and capital markets. Um, one of the, the intro classes to finance that I took, the professor put up the list of the TSX sixty stocks on the wall and said, everyone put your name beside a ticker. And we were expected to um, kind of follow those, the company that we had picked through the semester. And if anything relevant happened uh, over the course of the semester, we were to give an update to the class. Um, so not really a high level of, of workload, but it, it gave us that experience of, of following the markets um, in, a, in a real world setting, whereas a lot of the class was very much theory based. So that was interesting. Um, and that was probably one of the one of the more concrete examples I can give about why I decided to start uh, down the path of finance. But um, that was a big one. And then I did the co op program in university. So I, I did work in HR for a company. And it was fine. Um, and I definitely can, that was probably the other discipline that I considered pursuing the most. But then I had a co-op work term uh, in finance and uh, in equity research. And, um, you know, I liked, I liked the, the research and I liked the culture of the company. So I think that combined really cemented me with wanting to go down that path and continue pursuing, um, you know, studying finance and then pursue a career uh, with that company once I graduated. Okay. Which uh, company on the TSX did you follow? 
Uh, it was uh, Barrick Gold. Okay, uh, if you would have picked Nortel or uh, or uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not research that old. I in think motion, Nortel was not really around. At that <laughs> or, time. Yeah, but a research in motion type company, you you may have been in HR these days. Yes, well, and that was uh, that would have been in like oh wait, it was pre financial crisis, um, and gold was um, was doing very well at the time but research in motion i think that would have been maybe the person who ran the fastest probably picked it because that's the, one of the ones that people would have known <laughs> the name of more than some of the you know barrett gold um but uh but yeah <laughs> now the the follow-up question would be uh saskatchewan isn't a pure finance center you know especially in research analysts or you know the type of job that you're doing so coming out of university with the major in finance how difficult did you find it to actually receive a job offer i was very lucky um in that i took the co-op program in university and i would highly recommend that because a it can help you learn about the different fields, um, get different types of work experience, what types of companies you do or do not want to work for, and get your foot in the door of companies. So because I did a co-op work term um, with, at the time, Greystone Managed Investments, that got my foot in the door for when I graduated. And when I graduated, I came back and spent a year working as an intern with them, and I got the chance to work in fixed income for the real estate team and back with the equity team where I had spent my co-op term. And that led to a full-time permanent job offer. So it was it was a little bit easier because I was able to get my foot in the door through the co-op program and then the internship. Um, hiring an, an employee is a, is a very big deal for companies. Um, it costs them a fair bit of money to go through the interview process. They're spending resources to advertise and recruit and interview candidates and then um, to take a chance on someone that they don't totally know that person might not work out. So it is a big investment in the knowledge field of finance to hire new employees. And so getting those um, you know, four month, eight month, one year work terms where they can kind of try you out and you can try them out um, is a really great way to build your career and build those contacts. Even if you don't end up working for that company, it, uh, you know, it builds your, your network that might lead to something else in the future. Yeah, we're going to talk about networking a little bit later, I hope. But I mean, you're a thousand percent correct. Uh, in what you're saying, or at least I agree with you a thousand percent. It's one of those things where you need to get your face in front of the person that's doing the hiring or one of their network associates, uh, because it is such a crucial uh, investment by the company when they do hire somebody. It's a significant cost, so they want to make sure they get it right. And I think things like the co-op programs, internships, uh, in Saskatoon, we have, or Edward School of Business has a take a student to eat taste program where they get a chance to go out for lunch with someone like myself or another CFA and discuss the industry. And again, that's making a contact that you have going forward. Reaching out, coming out when we or the CPAs or whomever speaks at your university or high school and asking questions, making contacts. Uh, that's the big driver, I think, for getting hired more so than your GPA, especially when in a finance major, people tend to take the same electives, the same courses, and the GPAs are plus or minus the same. So again, that personal contact will help you differentiate yourself. Does that make sense? I totally agree with that. And I think that when you're coming out of university in those entry level positions, you know, to your point, what's really differentiating you? Um, you know, not that much. What differentiates you is the culture that 
you're going to work for and if you fit with that culture and hiring for fit was a big part of the process at my company because you know at that level you're going to be taught how to do a lot of the job there's no one's really expecting you to come in as a 20-year veteran of the industry with all this experience and, and ability you're still probably working on your CFA designation. Um, so they know that they can teach you a lot. It's it's how are you going to fit with the team culture? Do you have a good work ethic? What other skills do you have? Um, so that all becomes very important. And that's you know where that networking can really help, um, help you demonstrate those skills. And I think on that point, that's one area that Robin and I discussed in our hiring advice uh, uh, presentation is that the CFA shows employers that you have the ability to learn and learn quickly. So you have a very short learning curve. You have the perseverance because only one in five people that enter the CFA program make it through to get their degree. It takes often five years on average to pass a three-year program because of the pass rates. So it's that work ethic, that perseverance, that stick to it uh, failing something probably for the first time academically. Uh, all these things, whether you're working, you know, literally at Starbucks or McDonald's or at TD Asset Management, those are the traits that companies want. And so when you're going out to an interview, especially as a young person that doesn't have that uh, CFA designation, you know, whether you work at a bakery or whatever it is you do, think about the stories that you can demonstrate that show people that you can learn, that you do have the work ethic, the perseverance, the ability to succeed, time management skills, all these things are important to help differentiate yourself from someone that can't come up with a story. And whether that's running marathons, triathlons, in my case, martial arts, those, you know, those sort of t separate you from the herd a bit during the interview process. And the other thing I would say, and we'll touch on this a bit later as well, is I always like to see somebody, if you're in Saskatchewan, oh, what's this geology on your CV or your, uh, or your, you know, your grades? Well, I'm staying in Saskatchewan. It's a heavy natural resource and oil and gas sector in this province. So I thought it would be useful to learn about geology or petroleum engineering or things like that. And I'm not going to see that from so many other resumes. It's going to be, you know, criminology, sociology, astronomy. And again, that just sort of differentiates you. Do you agree or disagree with that, Paula? I, I agree with that. I think that um, the, the competition to get into schools and then to be, um, you know, in certain streams within schools and then the, to get into the job market is really causing people to just get more and more narrow. But a lot of value comes from being broad, especially early on. So to your point about geology, having that ability to know different industries, especially in equity research, all we do is research different industries. Um, that adds a lot of value and it speaks to someone who's well-rounded and can learn different things and can bring that diversity of thought to the table. Yeah, I think that's a good point. In, in the similar conversation that I had with Juliana Wong, that was probably her takeaway to, uh, in advice is that, you know, give yourself options, keep your, you know, when you're in college, you're just starting out in your career, you know, keep things broad. Don't try to focus on the, you know, on the one narrow path too quickly because you shut doors and you don't allow yourself that flexibility. So I think that's a good point uh, that you just made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think learning to think critically about those different areas, that's where you add value in equity research and, and probably in a lot of different types of companies and, and finance disciplines, especially is thinking critically is so important you know you can't just take this is how the textbook says and apply it in a broad overlay that's not going to add value so 
what teaches you to think critically is doing those different things and getting that broad experience. And that's, that's so important. Yeah. Because my view is that anyone can crunch numbers, you know, it's input in output out. Uh, it's the analytical side. It's the qualitative side that separates the, you know, the strong from the weak in, you know, financial analysis or just business in general, you have to have that understanding of, uh, what do the numbers mean? and everything's in context. Absolutely. So the next question would be, and this is kind of a, another debate issue, is should you start your CFA designation right after university? And in fact, I think now at level one, you can start in your final year, or does it make more sense to wait a few years and get that industry experience and some practical experience? So first of all, when did you start your CFA designation, level one? Uh, and what would you say would be sort of based on your experience, wait a bit or start earlier, which is your preference? Hmm. Well, I started my CFA designation uh, after my one year internship. Uh, so I didn't do it necessarily right away, but pretty much right away, I started working on my CFA designation. Um, in terms of what I would recommend, I, I think it might depend on your your path to the industry, because I think that that industry experience is really valuable. And um, so taking time to get that is, is important. Um, the flip side is that it never gets easier to do your CFA. <laughs> life only gets busier and you kind of want to move on with your life. So when I was studying for CFA, I was still in that university studying kind of mindset, didn't have a lot of extra stuff going on in my life in terms of marriage or kids at that point. So it was easy to devote a lot of time to the CFA. Yeah, uh, you know, if I think if I was trying to do that now uh, with a young family, it would be very, very challenging. So my advice would be to maybe balance those things a little bit. Um, and I don't know if there's really anything wrong with, you know, getting level one and then taking a little bit of time off and, and you know, doing level two and trying to balance getting some experience with pursuing the CFA at the same time. So it might depend on, I think, your individual circumstances. So not an easy answer. No, and I think that sort of coincides a bit with what Juliana and Robin and myself all have said is there's trade-offs. And I mean, the biggest advantage is you're fresh out of university. Uh, you probably don't have that, those other external factors that are butting in. Uh, and then when you hit sort of 30, if you start, maybe you've got a family, maybe you're already on a different career path that doesn't require the CFA. So, uh, and you're also less fresh as far as the ability to study just from a mental perspective. So it's kind of a trade-off, you know, in my case, I waited a few years and that was invaluable because I come from a professional accounting, a chartered accountant background, and so much of levels one and two is reliant on the ability to analyze financial statements and do ratio analysis and those things. So uh, it was a good investment for me to go the accounting route. Uh, and I was still, because I came out and was doing the CA exams and all that good stuff, uh, I was still in the study mode later on in life. Uh, so for me, that was better to wait, but definitely it's sort of up to the individual, but there are pros and cons and you have to sort of look at your uh, your own circumstances and desires, I guess. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So now you're at what's now known as TD Asset Management. Uh, and you're, I like think we said you do equity research. What exactly does that involve? So I don't know anything about what you do at TD. What would you tell me that you do and what do you like? What don't you like? So our clients uh, are institutional pension funds for the most part. Um, uh, 
since since Greystone amalgamated with TD Asset Management, there's obviously more retail channels that might be open to us. But um, you know, especially the majority of my career before joining TD Asset Management, and and still since then, our client base remains um, larger institutional uh, pension funds and endowments and things like that. So we ran we run equity portfolios with. Um, a bit of a, a growth at a reasonable price type of, of investment philosophy. So uh, sustainable earnings growth um, from you know, well-managed companies will lead to higher stock prices over time. Um, and our time horizon when looking at investments is on average, on, anywhere from really one to five years, kind of two-ish on average um, when, we're, when we're looking at investment opportunities. And so my team, we select the equities, the securities that go into uh, the portfolios that our clients are invested in. That's, that's essentially the, the equity research. Uh, so we research the companies and make recommendations to the portfolio management team about you know, which companies should be added to the portfolio, um, if we should sell a company. And then another big part of the job is maintaining coverage of what we currently own in the portfolio. So that would mean staying up to date on, on their earnings and financial results, company announcements, mergers and acquisitions, and making sure that they still fit with our investment philosophy, that there's no reason that we might want to either add to the position or exit the position. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a few questions, follow-up questions from what you said. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times institutional and pension. Uh, why would the investing pattern or does it differ between retail individual clients and institutional or pension? I think one of the biggest differences would be their time horizons. So some of our clients would be defined benefit pension plans and they can they know that they're going to need to pay retirement benefits to their plan members for, 50 plus years and the way that they think of how they manage that can be very different than an individual retail investor who has a, a very different uh, time horizon and investment goals and, and return goals um, and portfolio construction of the rest of their investments. So I think that retail versus institutional, those are two very different uh, types of clients um, to deal with. Um, and, and depending on the retail investors, you know, the, the level of, of knowledge of financial markets and sophistication can be vastly different. So when we're dealing with, um, the, 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 um, the fiduciary, uh, plan management team of pension funds, uh, oftentimes they're also CFA charter holders and, and have an experience in finance and capital markets. So the language that they can speak is a bit different than um, what you might encounter with retail clients. Yep. And I think that just to follow on what you're saying about the financial objectives is because of the pension, they have to assess the payout rates down the road with the retirees. So they're always concerned about matching cash flows coming in with expected cash flows coming out and probably have some more interest in uh, interest rate hedging or currency hedging to protect their positions. Absolutely. And even within that, you can have the defined benefit pension plans, which are concerned with their cash flow matching and doing asset liability studies. And then um, some plans that are uh, defined contribution and and even then their their investment goals might be slightly different because they're not doing the same asset liability studies they may have a little bit more of a, a hard uh, return threshold uh, you know it really can vary by client um, but yeah I, I think that you're right in terms of the the sophistication level and, and what kind of drives their decision making around hiring us as a manager now as far as uh sophistication uh obviously they have i mean like they're run by basically the equivalent of you so they're they understand investing you know to the similar extent as td asset management but when you talk sophistication 
Uh, does that also include more sophisticated or niche investments like maybe wind farm? Uh, because they're basically utilities that pensions love uh, because they do operate as a utility once they're up and running. Well, and I think that those types of investors have access to those private markets. Um, and at TD Asset Management, we have private real estate, uh, mortgages, and infrastructure funds that we offer to clients um, to meet their return objectives. And so they're able to uh, assess those investments and just have the access to, to make those investments where the retail channel isn't always able to you know, access a, a, in, an infrastructure fund um, just due to the way that the markets are set up and work. Okay. Now, when I talk to Robin, who's a wealth manager at Scotia, she's compensated. She eats what she hunts. She's bringing in new assets and new clients, and uh, she's under a percent asset under administration uh, fee model. So that's how she is compensated. I'm assuming you're more of a salary, uh, maybe a bonus included in there. That's probably more your compensation model at TD. Yeah, that would be the model on um, the, what we, I guess what we call the buy side for, uh, especially for managing institutional uh, money, it would be a base salary and then a bonus component. And the bonus component would be the eat what you hunt part where, you know, if our clients do well, we'll do well. If our clients don't do well, then we're not going to do well. <laughs> yep. But that said, I mean, what you just, what you just stated about, uh, that's not quite the same as say a hurdle rate with a hedge fund where if you exceed at TD, the agreed upon return, maybe you split the excess return 50 50 you guys wouldn't do that would you no it's not not like a hedge fund model no <laughs> no i'm aware of <laughs> at least i'm hoping that's not what td does but uh you see it in many places the problem with that model is they never refund if they underperform it's only uh, <laughs> yeah, the only exactly. share in the upside <laughs> yeah i've seen a lot of hedge funds in action so okay now just before we leave your job. Uh, I should have asked this earlier, but what is the difference between buy side and sell side? So uh, buy side is basically the people who are managing money uh, on behalf of clients. So what I do. Um, sell side is the, the kind of the flip side would be um, the types of jobs in the sell side are where they are working with companies who are trying to raise money and get investments from people like me. Um, they're working on mergers and acquisition analysis. Um, so it's kind of like two sides to the same coin. So I would deal with the sell side because they would write research reports on companies that I'm looking at investing in. So I can access a lot of information from them. Um, there's a lot of buy side firms and maybe not quite as many sell side firms. So they're a bit of the bridge to the management. So oftentimes on a company's earnings calls, it's the sell side people that call in and ask questions about the results um, because they have relationships with the management teams on those companies and they, they cover and then they would write up a report that the buy side would be able to, to read and, and use in their analysis. Okay. And I'm assuming that the buy and sell side at TD are very closely related and they share information between themselves. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> is, is that, is that a, a false assumption? <laughs> no, that's, uh, <laughs> there would be walls up to um, prevent because the sell side can have access to material non-public information that it would be highly illegal to uh, distribute to people who it shouldn't be distributed to. And so um, those are two different. So TD Asset Management is uh, who I work for. TD Securities would be the sell side arm. Um, and I, you know, I don't, uh, you know, they're part of the TD umbrella, but it, it's, it's a different, 
almost like a different company in some ways. Yeah, I think in the old politically incorrect days, uh, you used to call it Chinese walls between the uh, uh, those type of divisions, because again, as you just said, from a potential conflict of interest, uh, insider trading, all these things that the CFA Institute frowns upon, and the regulators definitely frown upon. Uh, and you law really... enfortement. <laughs> and law enforcement, not yeah. Frowned upon. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, to me, frowned upon is illegal. So uh, <laughs> it is something that uh, companies do try to maintain their distance and, and both in perception and reality, uh, keep their buy and sell sides on opposite ends of the spectrum. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of fir a lot of firms would have buy and sell side under their umbrella and they would, you know, maintain that that wall um, for both legal and ethical reasons. Yep. OK, that's good to know. Uh, job pressure. That was another area that we talked about in our uh, CFA series careers for all. And I think that the interesting thing with the CFA is that a lot of people sort of stereotype it as all financial analysts, sort of backroom uh, number crunchers. But, you know, you can do mergers and acquisitions, which is what I would consider pure job pressure or what Robin does, the eat what you hunt, where if you're not successful, you starve. Uh, at TD with your job, is it more steady work or are there wild fluctuations? What kind of, uh, what would you say is a job pressure if you worked in the sort of work that you do? I would say that the pressure is high because um, outperforming a, a, an index in the market is difficult. Um, adding value can be difficult uh, in the stock market. That's what we're paid to do. And um, it it's not necessarily easy to do. Um, so the pressure from that perspective can be high. Um, the expectations from our clients of us are high as they should be. Uh, in terms of the workflow, um, it's pretty steady um, and you know pretty busy all the time. Not um, not wild fluctuations. Um, there's a bit of a cadence to the workflow in terms of companies reporting quarterly earnings so that you know that comes four times a year so you kind of finish it and it's just about to to start again uh, and then researching new companies um so there it's always busy but um and the and the pressure to perform and make good investment recommendations and provide good returns for clients is always there but i think it's a little bit different from the wild fluctuations that other parts of the finance industry might see Okay. What about on the sell side of the business? If I'm doing uh, maybe IPOs or things like that, then to me, that would be more in the fluctuation side where it's quiet, quiet, quiet. And then suddenly it's all hands on deck for uh, until the project is finished. I think you're correct in that. I haven't worked on the sell side, but I think you're correct in that where it's, it can be a bit more, um, you know, something gets dropped on you and it's very high priority working very long days until until that's done okay now one of the things that we talked about uh, before we came on air here was you've got a background utilities real estate uh like u.s public equities now if i come out of university and i go to work for you know td in your capacity how do you develop the skill sets from the industry side and sort of what would you recommend to young people as far as non-financial technical skills uh, to bring to the table when they're hired? Yeah, that's a really good question and a good topic to touch on. Um, I think if I knew that I was going to be the mining analyst for a buy side company, it would have been great to have gone and gotten a geology degree and, you know, worked for a mining company and understand how, you know, a, a mine works and, and all the decisions that go into that. 
Um, so industry experience would have been very invaluable. Um, it, it would have been hard to get a huge breadth of industry experience because I would have had to have 10 careers before becoming an equity analyst and being able to apply that knowledge to whatever uh, sector I might be covering at that time because our, our sector coverage does change from time to time. So in that breadth, industry experience is valuable. And if, um, you know, some people might not think that finance is a career for them and they go and, um, you know, kind of become an engineer and then maybe their interests change and they find their way to finance, that can be very valuable. But for me and my experience coming out of university and then going uh, and, and working as an equity research analyst, to develop, you know, how does the utility industry work that I started covering that sector? It was reading a lot of sell side uh, research reports and a lot of Googling, like how does a coal plant work? How does a natural gas plant work? Um, to try to understand how to speak the lingo of whatever sector that you're covering. And so it's, it doesn't happen overnight. It can be a very steep learning curve at times, um, especially depending on the, the, the industry that you're looking at. But that's basically the job of equity research is researching and learning. And to be able to make good investment recommendations, you have to have some level of understanding of the industry and how that business works to understand what drives its financial performance. Yeah, and I think from that, I would say sort of two things to anyone listening to this is that not having a finance background does not preclude you from having a very successful career in finance. Because as Paula just said that, you know, if you're living in Saskatchewan, you know, agriculture, natural resources, these are sort of key industries here. So if you're working for us, a, a smaller shop that focuses on the prairies, having some experience, exposure and experience in natural resources is a great boost to your career. Uh, and that's the same if you're a finance major, just adding a couple of courses to develop a base knowledge or coming in as a petroleum engineer, a geologist, a geophysicist, those sort of things. So again, look at where you're going. And one of the themes that we touched on in the growth industries going forward is that the two hot areas for finance that I see over the next five or 10 years are ESG environmental, social, governance, and fintech. And for someone like myself, I don't have that training in any of those areas. So if you're coming out of school and you've got a bit of a background on social issues, on governance or uh, environment or fintech, then you're at a competitive disadvantage to many financial professionals that are already out there and that translates into getting more job offers. So what would you think about that, Paula, like as far as the growth industries go that you see? I think you're right about those two areas. ESG is a big focus for uh, my company. It's a big focus for our clients. Uh, clients around the world are demanding more and more ESG disclosure, a focus on it, a way to analyze it. Um, it's, it's a very big area and it's only going to get bigger and same with fintech. And I think if fintech right now and cryptocurrencies, those are really kind of hot. Um, but I mean, technology has always driven innovation in every industry in for the past hundreds of years since the industrial revolution. So something that seems rudimentary to us now was revolutionary 50 years ago. So always staying on top of the technology innovation is, is what's going to drive uh, financial markets because it creates efficiencies, can ultimately creates value and finance is all about finding value. Yeah, I think that's well said. And I think it's not even 50 years. It's uh, when we looked at the growth industries, Robin and myself, uh, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, blockbuster video was dominant. And then Netflix came along, I think, in 2004. And suddenly blockbuster is gone and Netflix is dominant. 
And then last year we saw that uh, Netflix lost 31% of their market share because of the entrance of things like Peacock, Amazon Prime, Disney. So everything just is in flux all the time. And if you're young, I think that's a good area to focus on because your knowledge level will give you an advantage over people that, you know, have been in the industry for 30 or 40 years and maybe aren't aware of the current trends. Absolutely. That's interesting. You mentioned Blockbuster because I just saw in maybe on LinkedIn or somewhere on the internet an infographic that um, did just dots of all the Blockbuster locations in the U.S. starting in the 80s up until today. So you got to see the dots grow and grow over 5,000 locations, I think, at one point. 9,100. Oh, globally. Yeah, prob globally, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and this was just a map of the U.S., but you got to see kind of how it peaked. And I think the peak was a couple of years after, uh, you know, Netflix came in. And then, and I can just imagine being a financial analyst and it, well, sometimes we have a quarterly focus on results and you need to bring yourself back and have a longer term and a bigger world view of that because, uh, management can explain anything away for a quarter, but all of a sudden in two years, you've gone from 5,500 locations to 4,000. That's material. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting with Blockbuster was that they had an opportunity to purchase Netflix way back, you know, in the, in the first couple, three years that Netflix was operating and they declined. And again, that gets at things like the fintech or you know the company itself isn't reading the trends and the way the consumers the big data you know that sort of thing where they're analyzing what the consumer is doing and because they ignored that both the technology and the consumer trends they decided not to pursue netflix and then in a few short years they're out of business and, uh, and netflix is dominant and whether netflix can continue that dominance uh, is a different story. The other thing that you'd mentioned, which is interesting, and this is a problem with banks in general or companies to some extent, is there short-term gratification. So many people receive bonuses based on current year performance or results. And so often there's a hesitance to take that 10 year time frame, uh, because again, a lot of your clients, when you talked about them earlier, if you say, oh, sit back, you know, we've got, you know, our time frame is 10 years. And you said earlier that there's sort of a two year focus. They're not going to be happy with you if you're not getting results in the first four or five years. Yeah, that balance, especially in the public markets, can be challenging. Um, but look at some of the most successful companies today. Amazon. For how many years did Amazon have negative earnings per share? quite a few yeah. and you know you need uh, a, a ceo and and leadership at the company with the vision and the ability to withstand that and not all companies are set up that way i mean amazon was able to do it because jeff bezos was the majority shareholder and essentially couldn't really be fired by the board because he was the majority shareholder whereas you know management teams who are not which is a, more of the norm um you know they're hired and fired by the board of directors and the board of directors is accountable to shareholders and, and the shareholders want more <laughs> short term Exactly. So it's, it can, it, it, it drives all areas of the market, you know, as much as we take a, a fairly long term view of investments, um, even two years is kind of a long term view. That's the average. Um, there are companies that we have held in the portfolio for 10 plus years. And, and then depending on the industry, some are a little bit more cyclical and tend to exit and enter, um, you know, in yep. in a, in a shorter time frame um but you know it, it's it's a challenge of the industry to to do that and it's something that on my team we talk about and are aware of and are trying to lay the groundwork for you know how do you get repeatable good performance every year and set yourself up to do it 
year after year, kind of like that. What you're, what you're doing today is setting yourself up for performance a few years down the road, not necessarily just next quarter, because that's harder and harder to sustain if you're only just chasing quarterly performance. So what Amazon did five years ago was laying the groundwork for their massive success today. So you have to, you know, balance that. And it's, it's a challenge of the industry for sure. Yeah. And I think that uh, to me, I mean, Bezo is a, is a good example, but you know, I always sort of use Buffett, Warren Buffett as a, as a great example because he was always focusing on the long term, and, you know, that's his investment philosophy was find, you know, companies, buy them and, you know, keep them. And because he was successful, people could put up with that. And if you look at NFL football, a Bill Belichick type guy that's had past success, so you give them the benefit of the doubt. And the one thing when you talk strong CEOs, people often forget about Steve Jobs. In the 80s, he was fired. Mm -hmm. He was useless. And then they finally brought him back 10 years later and now he's considered, you know, the the superstar. But there was a time there where they said, you're useless, you and Wozniak go away. And, you know, again, because I think Jobs was looking more longer term and the shareholders and the board said, no, that's not acceptable. So uh, just always in history, some interesting examples to look at of how people run their businesses and and how things change. I think another good example is um, Facebook. And this is in the, the movie about Facebook, the social network, which is fictionalized. So I don't know how much of this is actually true, but I think the 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 core of this story is, is that they were achieving a lot of traction and gaining members. And there was a huge push by so many people to immediately monetize what they had. And in the movie, it portrays Mark Zuckerberg as being very, very reluctant to monetize in those, you know, first many, many years. And that laid the groundwork for it to not just be a flash in the pan social network that you know we had seen i can think of a handful that were you know don't have that staying power of facebook has had for you know well over a decade and yeah, so I, that rush to monetize needs to be balanced with with growth yeah the problem with that philosophy to me is that i've seen a lot of businesses out there that you know succeeded because their timing was right and others that, you know, if Facebook monetized and it didn't work, you'd never know what Facebook was now. And there's a lot of companies out there that, you know, their timing was fantastic. Like, you know, uh, Murray Edwards is a, is a big name in Saskatchewan and he's a very good investor, but part of it was he was in the right place at the right time. And if you're trying to start an oil company in Alberta, when they're introducing the carbon tax and all these things, uh, you know, you might be the best oil person out there, but if the timing's not right and the circumstances aren't right, uh, it makes it a lot more difficult to succeed. Absolutely. Luck versus timing. And I think every investor thinks that, you know, did I, did I really pick a good stock? Did I get lucky? Like, you know, and we, we ask ourselves those questions to become better investors on my team where you know, we do postmortems um, annually with the team and, and after uh, you know, a, a security is sold and at different points in time to kind of say, it, I recommended buying this, this stock for X, Y, and Z. Did it go up? Did it go down? Did it go up? because of X, Y, and Z, or did it go up for completely different reasons and I just got lucky? Yeah, and that's kind of if you, uh, if you know who Annie Duke is, uh, she's a poker player, but she writes a lot of books on probability analysis and uh, applying probabilities to your business decisions. That's a lot of what she focuses on is that you want to analyze your successes, not just your failures, because mm -hmm. maybe you got lucky and uh, yeah, that's kind of the thing is that you win 
maybe it's good strategy, but maybe it's just luck and that luck will come back and bite you in the future. And but, that goes back to the repeatable performance that I talked about where if if I've picked a stock and make it, make a buy recommendation and it goes up and I feel like, oh, I'm so good at this. If you don't go back and do the post-mortem work on it to understand, well, was I lucky or is there something that I did that could be repeatable? That's where you start laying the groundwork for repeatable performance. Exactly. It's all about the process and the results come from that. And sometimes a sound proper process leads to negative results and sometimes bad processes lead to good results. But I'd rather have a few dogs and have a strong process than get lucky with a bad process. Because again, that's going to come back and hurt you in the future. Exactly. Okay. Now we've talked a bit about technical skills. What about some of the soft skills? And one of the things that, again, my experience has been is that if I come out of college or I, you know, I'm a relatively young CFA, then maybe I need to calculate modified durations and, uh, you know, asset correlations, all these sort of things. But as I move up the corporate ladder, it's all about the soft skills, my presentation skills, my communication skills, my networking skills. And I think that's something to me anyways, that young people should be developing whilst they're young. And at the start of this conversation, we did talk a bit about networking and how you used your internship to start building those corporate ties that helped you get a job. So what are your thoughts about soft skills for people to start developing and uh, any advice? Yeah, I think that they're very important. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, to your point, develop them early. They're like a muscle. You need to use them uh, to keep them strong. And uh, I would just look for any ways to develop them, especially in early on in your career in, in low risk scenarios. So, um, you know, Early on in your career, you're probably not going to be put out in front of clients and trying to win business right away. But can you be working on uh, giving presentations internally at your company to help you develop those speaking skills and putting together presentations? Uh, and, you know, uh, when I pitch a stock to our portfolio management teams, um, you're kind of selling it to them. And of course, the investment stands alone on its merits, but you know, just even going through the motions of how do you portray information to someone else in a way that is thoughtful, it makes sense, you're trying to help them understand the investment, just as if I was going to see a client. I'm trying to help the client understand my company, my team, if they're a current client, understand why their performance was what it was, so, you know, you can always kind of tailor that, even if I'm, you're early in your career and not seeing clients, you can be able to build presentations um, and ways of communicating internally before you kind of have to go external uh, where the risk is uh, or the stakes are a bit higher. Yeah, I would agree fully with that. I would also, if you're not in a position where you can you know, make the internal presentations is look at things like Toastmasters, Dale Carnegie, even service clubs like Rotary or Kiwanis, where you're out, you know, involved in projects and you're interacting with other people where you do have to build your communication and interpersonal skills. And again, you often have to sell yourself or your organization uh, you know, when you're doing funding or, uh, you know, social events, these sort of things. So there are ways to improve your communication skills. And I don't think that communication or presentations is usually an innate, uh, skill set. It's something that you get better at by practicing. So take advantage of that. Absolutely. And the quote unquote extracurricular activities um, you know, that can be involved in in high school and university, but 
even in the workforce, things like, you know, CFA Society Saskatchewan is a bit of an extracurricular activity that can help you build skills that if that your job might not necessarily entail at that point, And that can help you, you know, get your next job. Yeah, fully, fully agree with that. Uh, and I think the other thing just on, you know, you can never overdress is an old thing that I used to hear, you know, you, like you want to look professional, act professional. And it's kind of one of those things. I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Paula, but, you know, the new person that joins your organization, if in the first week they're late for work or they're unprepared, that's their first impression on many of the existing staff. And that tends to last a long time. And if they come in and, you know, you're, you know, gung ho and you're in good, you know, good professionalism, then when something, a mistake is made three months out, it's not, oh, you know, we expected that because he's, you know, coming in late that first week. It's, oh, you know, this person, that's an anomaly because we have in his, our minds that this is a professional employee. And so again, that sort of uh, laying the groundwork for how you're viewed by colleagues, I think is often important. First impressions are very important that way. You're absolutely right. And um, I, it, it's hard to advise anyone against ever being over prepared. Um, the only caveat to that is uh, recently with a, a discussion with some uh, a women's network, uh, the the concept of you know being over prepared to the point where you feel paralyzed, mm, yeah, um, is not good. But you know, early in your career, it is hard to be over prepared. Yeah, I think uh, I think I'm not sure it's the same concept, but there's the uh, paralysis by analysis where. Mm -hmm. you're, uh, and the other caveat that I would put in there is. I don't want to sound demeaning to anyone listening, especially college kids, but you know, nothing, you know, you just because you're a finance major, you really know nothing about finance. And I know, you know, nothing like that's just the way it is. I don't expect you to know anything. And what always drives me crazy is I'd rather have a young person talk to me and ask question after question after question, as opposed to trying to impress me with how much he or she knows. And that's one thing that just drives me crazy is I don't expect you to know much. So don't try to impress me with what you know, because, you know, half of it's wrong anyways. And I think that's a, a problem just in general as people come in, whether it's a job interview or you meet them at a social event and they're trying too hard to show that they know what they're talking about. And it just tends to come across, uh, uh, completely the opposite of what you intended? I think a big challenge is going from the model of school that we've been trained in for 20-ish you know, years of uh, that there is an answer and that you're right or you're wrong. And, and we can quantify that with a grade. And then you enter the workforce and it's not at all like that. Not even a little bit. And, you know, I think that that's something I didn't appreciate and I'll probably try to teach my kids is that critical thinking and asking questions is way more valuable than, you know, getting a gold star from a teacher. Yeah, because I... you see, you see those, you know, and I felt like that coming out where you didn't, if I didn't know what I, if I didn't know what a hundred percent and I couldn't, and I, I wanted to be great at a hundred percent, it's hard to speak up at work. Um, but you're right. Expectations are not, that high in terms of you know knowledge expectations are high for work ethic and trying hard and being curious um but especially in, in in investing you know some of my colleagues and bosses who have been doing this for 30 plus years they don't know the answer they don't know like yes or no this investment will be good or bad it's not black and white like that no, and I, th and I think the advantage of experience is that you have some self-confidence in your own abilities. And so you're not afraid to say, I don't know what the answer is. I know how to find out the answer and I know what process I need to implement to find that. But, you know, you're, you're better off you know, saying, I don't know, but I'll figure it out as opposed to just sort of, uh, you know, uttering 
as you said, the, you know, the textbook answer, which in the real world tends to be incorrect anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we've covered a bit on soft skills. Uh, one of the things is that you were single, then you got married and, you know, the work world was work world. And then what was it? Two years ago, you had your first child and now you're expecting another. Uh, how have you found that, you know, switch to a family, like a younger family impacted your career? And do you think that, you know, companies today provide uh, better support for people that do go on maternity or paternity leave? Um, you know, how have you found sort of juggling the, uh, the work life balance? Yeah, well, it's interesting for me because I came back from maternity leave to a work from home environment with COVID. So, you know, that was a very different dynamic in some ways, uh, a lot easier, um, didn't have as much of the commute and the rush and, and all of that. Um, but also a bit hard, you know, career wise coming back to like a spare bedroom and a computer screen and wanting to build those networks again. So that was definitely you know, a very different thing to deal with. Um, I think that m my company has been very supportive. They're very supportive of, um, you know, I want to say working mothers, but of working parents, because in this day and age, um, it's not just mothers, people are parents, men are parents as well. And everyone, you know, loves their family and wants to have a, a good work-life balance of feeling you know, fulfilled and successful at work, but also having those moments with your family. Um, so it's, it's like the age old question, it's never going to be, be easy. But I think finding a company with a strong culture around that who recognizes that you're a human, not a robot, who has things outside of work and that those things outside of work can make you a better employee can make you more engaged can give you more purpose in life to do what you do um you know that's where you're going to find fulfillment yeah and i think that i mean we talked about this a little bit earlier about the uh uh the cost that is required from a company to hire and train an employee and it used to be okay if you're on maternity leave, you're out of the, uh, the corporate ladder path. And I always thought it was a mistake, that sort of approach, because we lost so many strong people who just wanted to start families or have a bit of a better work-life balance. And it's nice to see that a lot of companies are trying to find that flexibility. So there is a a middle route and you can keep the strong employees still employed uh, in a slightly different position. And what's interesting is that when the law firms and the accounting firms created these principal and directorships to get people off the partnership route, but still have a senior position <clears throat> is that men took advantage of that to a high extent as well, because they just wanted that work-life balance and whether that's you know parenthood from the from the man side or just i'm not prepared to be working an 80 or 90 hour week uh salary and compensation isn't as important to me as you know spending a little bit of quality time with a family or friends and so it's it's interesting to see that uh now the the counter to that obviously is in my career path uh if you're not willing to do the work, someone else is going to come along to do it. So, you know, you have to be a little bit realistic, I think, at times. And uh, just in a general, you know, if I'm not willing to work 50 hours a week, uh, someone else is going to be willing to work 70 hours a week and they're going to get the projects and the and the promotions. And that's just the way it goes. Well, it's a, it's a balance in terms of, yeah, you, you have to, you know, be available and work hard when you're there. But I think that there is a shift in, um, you know, recognizing that that balance is important at some level. And especially in knowledge work, it's, you know, you're not necessarily just creating exactly a hundred widgets every day. 
it, it ebbs and flows. And so, you know, providing that flexibility to employees is you're going to get back um, when you need it. So I think that there's more of a recognition that way as well, because some, some times of the year are busier than others. I mean, obviously for accountants, tax season is very busy. And so I think the expectation around that time is that people are probably putting in more hours, but can they give that back? you know, another time of the year. And, and that's, I think you're seeing a little bit more of that. Yeah. And another point that you made, which was interesting and is this work at home world. And it's funny because I talk to a lot of younger people and they think this is fantastic. We get up, we put on our sweatpants, we go to our, you know, <laughs> our computer at the kitchen table. And to me, it's again, from a work perspective, it may work, but it's that interactions and the, you know, networking with your colleagues and your bosses and just seeing your boss, you know, at the coffee machine in the morning and having that two minute conversation, that's what drives your upward, uh, mobility in a company is sort of just, you know, gain the social skills and the, in the networking. And I think a lot of people are losing out because they don't have that physical contact. I would say 99% of the people I talk to would prefer to have a lot more flexibility to work from home, but almost no one wants a hundred percent work from home. You know, we are missing those connections and the networking and just the, you know, interpersonal interaction like of course it's great some days to not have to commute when it's minus 50 out and you know you can stay in your sweatpants that's that's great those days but you know in the long run that's just it's not sustainable for who we are as humans and for um you know fulfilling careers even like i i came back from mat leave during work from home and there were challenges with kind of onboarding and you can't just like pop your head into the office next door and say like, Hey, my computer setup seems a little bit off. Can, can I see what it looks like on yours? Like all of those things kind of add up. And, you know, some of, some of my best friends, I met them at work and, um, you know, through CFA studying together, my, my husband that way. So, um, you know, you can't just sit in a blank room that, and that's not how you build a career and, and a fulfilling career at that, that. No, I agree with that. So before we wrap things up, I'm just, the question I kind of ask people is, if you look back at 17 year old Paulo, you know, you're in grade 11, 12 kind of era, or 24 year old when you're just finishing university, if you could talk to yourself, what kind of advice would you give that would possibly make your current career trajectory a, a smoother or a more interesting? I think the number one piece of advice would be don't get too narrow too soon. I think there was a big uh, desire to be able to say, I'm going to do finance. I'm going to take all the finance classes and, you know, pursue that. And, and, and that's been great, but there's no need to rush in getting too narrow uh, too soon. So take those other courses that you just plain find interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's just going to help your knowledge base. You know, don't be afraid to ask a question. And, you know, it's so hard. It feels like Oh, no one else is asking this so everyone else must know it no they're probably all thinking it and they're all also afraid to ask it so kind of you know especially starting off a career um you know understand that asking questions is viewed much more favorably than than being silent and trying to make it look like you know everything because no people know that you don't know everything when you start your career yeah i'd agree a hundred percent with both of those uh, advices is that uh, I like employees that come and ask me questions. And unfortunately, if you work for me, I'm very Socratic in my management style. So I'm the guy that's asking you questions to make sure you understand what's going on. Uh, so don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, it doesn't make you look dumb or not knowledgeable. It actually shows that you have some confidence in your own abilities and 
therefore you're not afraid to ask about things you don't know or want confirmation on. Absolutely. So I thank you very, very much, Paula, for your time. I muchly appreciate it. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? No, I mean, thank you for the, the chat and the opportunity to talk about my uh, career path and just and thoughts on things in general. It's been great. Great. And I'd also like to take a quick moment and thank our corporate sponsors for uh, their support on these kind of series that we're doing without the assistance of uh, the companies uh, that help CFA Society Saskatchewan. We couldn't do much of what we do. So thank you very much. And for those of you that are interested in learning a little bit more about the CFA designation, uh, you can go to either of the links that are on the screen right now, the CFA Society Saskatchewan website, or CFA Institution itself. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you learned something and were entertained by this session. Thanks.